video, we're going to do some uh, guided exam question practice on the 2020 questions that came up on atomic structure. So there's a full question and a couple of smaller questions here. So uh, we're going to go ahead and jump into these. Start a timer about 25 minutes uh, is how much time I have to do that. Hopefully it won't take us that long. All right, let's jump in. As you can see here, here it was uh, either a short question or a section of a question that came up somewhere. So probably a question four. And it said uh, to draw... So what we're asking, we're being asked to do, the action word is to draw, and it's asking for a labelled diagram. Okay, so draw a labelled diagram of Thomson's plum pudding model of the atom. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. Draw a labelled diagram, and it's Thomson's plum pudding. All right, so let's jump over here, and I want you to pause the video and draw a uh, plum pudding model. Draw and label. So we'll do that now. Right, this is what you should have. You should have a, a sphere drawn, which we just draw as a circle. Uh, I'm going to put a big plus sign in the middle uh, to show that this is a sphere, a positively charged sphere. So a positive sphere. So that's one of the labels. And then we want to draw the negative electrons studded in. So each of these then represents a negative electron. Now, I'm not going to go into any of the theory behind the plum pudding model because we did that in class. If you want to find out more about that, then we you can go back and watch that. These are electrons studded in. So that was quick. That was probably seven marks in a short question. Nice and easy. All right, let's look at the next one. What isotope is produced so what isotope is produced when the nucleus of an americium-241 atom releases an alpha particle? So key here, this is alpha decay. All right, so to find out what isotope is produced, the way we've got to do this is, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you what you've got to do. Uh, if you can do this already, pause the video by yourself and figure out this question. All right, so if you didn't know how to do it, I'm going to give you some hints and clues. Okay, so it's alpha decay. So to find out what isotope is produced, we would need an alpha decay equation. Okay, so now that I've told you that, that that's what you need to do, hopefully you can do that. I'm just going to scroll back over so you can see the isotope. It's americium-241. So go ahead and do that over here now. Okay, so uh, you should only be playing if you've done this. If you didn't know how to get it started, maybe I can help you. I'll give you another chance. I'm going to guide you along. That's the whole point of the videos. We got americium and the numbers were, well, the atomic number is 95 and it's americium 241. So the mass is 241. When we're writing an alpha decay equation, well, we're going to show what's produced when it undergoes alpha decay. So we've got to fill in these boxes. So again, I'm helping you for the people who maybe needed a little bit of help with that. Well, it's alpha decay, so that means I'm producing an alpha particle, so I'm showing that here. And uh, what is the mass and the atomic number of an alpha particle? All right, guys, I think you can do this. So I'm gonna give you another chance to pause the video and figure this out. All right, so what you should have is an alpha particle has an atomic number of two and a mass number of four. Okay, so obviously this has left the nucleus. Well, then this is a mass of four is missing and two of the atomic number is going to be missing, which makes these numbers 93 and 237. Okay, so again, if you didn't know how to do this, you have another chance to at least do a bit of it, pause the video and find out what is the new nucleus, what is the new element. Okay, so the new element that you should have found in the periodic table with the atomic number 93 is the element Neptunium, NP. All right, so that was that, that's easy peasy. So long as you could work out what you were actually supposed to do, you were supposed to write an uh, alpha decay equation, that's what helps you figure out what isotope will be produced, okay? All right, so then that was the two short bits, okay? They were probably six or seven markers each. This then is where we're getting into one full question. So this is a 20 minute question, okay? Uh, I think it's a full question, yeah, okay. All right, so let's read the blurb, okay? Now, usually the blurb isn't that important, but there might be some important things in here. What does it say? The reactivity of an element is determined by the number and arrangement of electrons around the nucleus in each of its atoms. So nothing new there, just that the amount of electrons around the, the nucleus, especially the ones in the outer shell, that's what decides the reactivity. Around 1913, Bohr proposed that electrons in an atom occupied energy levels. 
So Bohr and his energy levels, nothing new for us there. Later then, sublevels and orbitals were introduced into atomic theory to account for certain in experimental observations. So it's not telling us what those are, but there must be something in experiments. Again, we did study these, which kind of suggested that these things existed, sublevels and orbitals. The diagram below are two different representations, two different representation of the first six energy levels in the electron cloud of a hydrogen atom. Now, hydrogen only has one electron, okay? So what are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing all the different energy levels shown by the different rings here, and then the different steps here as we move away, the amount of energy is getting higher and so on. And what this seems to be showing us is when an electron goes from n equal to three to n equal to two, it moves between energy levels. We call these the tran electron transitions. Well, energy seems to be given off like that there. And that's kind of what it's shown here as well. n equal to three going to n equal to two. And again, it's releasing energy. So again, this should be very familiar to us from Bohr's theory. Okay, so the first question, sorry, I... I've wrote all this color coded from my practice. So uh, I'm very quickly going to get rid of that for us so I can go through it one step at a time for you guys. Okay, let's go ahead and read part A. What does part A say? Part A says, what is an electron? Okay, it's worth five marks. What does that tell us? Probably going to be two key points. We want two key points of what an electron actually is. Uh, because if it was one point, it would only be really worth three. So what is it? Describe what it is and maybe give some of its properties. Okay, so what it is, where you'd find it, give some of its properties. So just here, what is an electron? So part A, go ahead, pause the video, write that down. Okay, so the first thing we should have said is define what it actually is. Well, it's a small particle inside the atom. We could say it's a sub, sorry, I don't know what's going on, on the screen here. It's a subatomic particle. I don't know what's going on with this writing. This has never done this before. Okay, it's a subatomic particle. Okay, now that's what, that defines what it actually is. Now, can you give any of its properties or any descriptions of it? So if you didn't know it was a subatomic particle, write that down and any descriptions that you can. Okay, so what about its charge and where you find it? Okay, pause the video, make sure you've got them things. So subatomic particle, what do we know about it? With a, well, it's got a negative charge. So we wrote that negative charge. And where do we find it? Okay, well, it orbits the nucleus. That orbits the nucleus. That's a pretty good description of, uh, of an electron. Now you might have talked about, you might be say it found in orbitals. That's also okay. Instead of orbits nucleus, definitely want to say it's got negative charge. You might talk about its mass. It has ne ne negligible mass. Uh, any of those, if you've got two of them, that's probably enough, but probably what's underlined here is important because we are asked what it is. So it's a small particle inside the atom or it's a subatomic particle. Right, the next bit, part B. Why might the electron in a hydrogen atom not occupy the N equal to one energy level? Okay, so we know that the electron in an atom is normally in its ground state. Bohr told us that. Why might it not occupied at n equal to one. In other words, what has to happen to it for it to not be there? Okay, so part B, so this is B part one. Why would the electron not be in n equal to one? Okay, so pause the video and describe why would it not be there? Okay, so you're looking for the conditions that would cause it to not be in n equal to one. Okay, so hopefully you wrote something about it. If it has absorbed energy or when it absorbs energy, if it has Absorbed energy. What do we say about the electron then? What do we say, how would we describe it? If it absorbs energy on the next line, pause the video. Okay, we would say it is excited. So if it's not in n equal to one, it's excited. It's gone to n equal to two, n equal to three, or so on. We know there's only one electron and it can go, it can transition to other energy levels if it absorbs enough energy. Right, the next one. What color light, what color light is associated with the electron in a hydrogen atom moving from n equal to three to n equal to two? Now, this is a very tricky and tough question, okay? Uh, 
because this isn't really on the course, but for some reason they've asked this, right? Now, we know that electrons moving to n equal to two are what give colored light, okay? So n equal to three to n equal to two will give light that we can see. n equal to four to n equal to two will give light that we can see. n equal to five to n equal to two will give light that we can see. n equal to six to n equal to two will give light that we can see. Okay, all of them will give light that we can see because they all fall to n equal to two. Now, the lowest energy one of these though is the n equal to three to n equal to two because there's not much energy difference here. This is the lowest energy transition, n equal to three to n equal to two. Now we know that the colors we can see between are red at one end, and then all the colors in between, so red is the first color of the rainbow, and all the colors in between up to, say, the color violet. I don't know if that's violet or not. Well, all the colors in between here, we can see all of these, okay? We go above there then, we have somewhere called UV, ultraviolet. And if we go below red, we have this region called infrared, okay? Now, the blue lights up here, these are the ones with the most energy. These down here, this has, are the ones with the least energy. So reds are colors with lower energy and then blues, okay? So as we go from red to blue, we're talking, sorry, so red is lower energy light. Sorry, not low easy. What am I thinking about? Low energy, sorry. So red light is colored light that has a low amount of energy. Blue, purples and blues, these are higher energy or higher frequency lights. So if this here, this transition, n equal to three to n equal to two is the lowest energy transition, it's lower in energy than from n equal to six to n equal to two, well then these are likely to be the, uh, the violet colors, the high energy colors. And the lower ones down here, these are likely to be the low energy colors, low energy colors like red. Okay, so we were asked, what color light is associated with the electron in a hydrogen at a moving from n equal to three to n equal to two? Very tricky this, but the answer would be red because it's a low energy difference and the light that corresponds to low energy, the light that we can see is red. Okay, so very tricky question. Uh, red light is the correct answer here. All right, so uh, I, there's no point in me expecting you guys to guess that one. I had to talk you through it. Um, I'm not sure how they expected. Well, look, it, you know, again, that's one of those that really separates a H1 student from a H2. A H1 student might be able to figure that out, but it's very difficult. Next one. Name the series of visible lines on hydrogen emission spectrum. So this one's a lot easier. Name the series of the visible lines. Okay, so visible lines. I'm going to write the answer to that right here, please. Okay, so do that now. What do we call a series of visible lines? Pause the video. Do that now. Okay, so what I should have said is the Balmer series. Okay, so it's the Balmer series. All right, on to the next one. We're on to part C now. Okay, so what does it say here? It says how many sublevels? So how many sublevels are associated with n equal to three? Again, I don't think I need to explain too much about this. Pause the video and write it down. Okay, so the answer here is, well, if you're not sure, you can always go through them. But I did tell you that the number of sublevels is always equal to the number of the main energy level. So for example, n equal to one has one sublevel, n equal to two has two sublevels, n equal to three has three sublevels, n equal to four has four sublevels. But if you're not sure, you can write them all out. But the answer here is three. I'm not gonna go through that. If you're not sure, you need to go back and watch how we did that when we were building up um, electron configurations. What is an atomic orbital? Here is this bloody definition again. Hopefully you can see this is coming up every single year now. What is an atomic orbital? So pause the video over here and write that down, the definition for an atomic orbital. Okay, so again, you should only play in the video if you've written that down. I'm not actually gonna write this down again because I'm sick of writing it down myself. Actually, do you know what? I should set a good example. I am gonna, set, I am gonna write it down. It's a region or a space, so a region or an area in space where, sorry, actually, I keep forgetting this. 
uh, around the nucleus. It's not just in a random place, it's always around the nucleus where there is a high probability, a high likelihood, high probability of finding an electron. Okay, so that's what we should have written exactly word for word. Again, if you don't know those, that's something you have to work on. Okay, because it's guaranteed marks. Next one, how many orbitals? So how many orbitals are associated with the N equal to two energy level? How many orbitals? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity to figure that out by yourself. And if you can't, in a second, I'm going to give you a clue. How many orbitals are found in the N equal to two energy level? Pause the video, write it down. Okay, so hopefully you can figure it out by yourself. If you're not sure how to do this, if you're not sure how to count it, do out the spin diagram, the electron spin diagram for just the N equal to two energy level. Do that now. Okay, so this is what I would have done here. Okay, I would have done, okay, so what's the N equal to two energy level? We've got the two S and we've got the two P. So if I was drawing a spin diagram there, I would say, okay, well, this is the two S. And this is the 2p. Okay. Each box here is an orbital. So in total here, we have one, two, three, four orbitals. So the n equal to two energy level has four orbitals in it. Next one. What is the maximum number of electrons that could occupy the n equal to three energy level in a multi-electron atom? So what is the maximum number? Of electrons that could occupy the n equal to three energy level in a multi-electron atom. So this bit here at the end is a waffly big mouthful, but all it means is it's an electron, it's an atom with lots of electrons. So assume there's lots of electrons in there. What's the maximum number that can go in the n equal to three energy level? Okay, so over here, and we're going to line, line, line it up here. Max electrons in n equal to three. This is part four of part C, so it's C part four, okay? No, no, sorry, it's, yeah, it's C, C part four. All right, so pause the video and write down this now. Okay, so hopefully you figured that out. If you didn't, again, I'm gonna help you. Uh, in an N equal to three energy level, what sublevels do we have? Write down the sublevels we have in an N equal to three energy level, do that now. Okay, so hopefully you said that we've got the three S, the three P, and the 3D. Okay, under each of these, I want you to write down how many electrons can go into each of these things. Pause the video, write it down. Okay, S sublevels can hold two electrons. P sublevels, how many can they hold? If you didn't get it, write it down. How many can a P sublevel hold? Okay, P sublevel can hold six, and a D sublevel can hold 10. Add them up, get the total number of electrons. Do that now, pause the video. Very simply, 18 electrons is a total. Okay, so a D, uh, the th third energy level, N equal to three, can hold 18 electrons. All right, we're getting towards the end of the question now. Uh, it says, write the SP configurations for beryllium, neon, magnesium, and krypton. Holy hell, that's a lot of stuff in one part. Okay, now be careful, though, because we don't want to jump straight into this stuff and forget that we had to do this. So write the SP electronic configurations for beryllium, Neon, magnesium, and krypton. This is 21 marks. So we're definitely getting marks for each of these. So electron configurations for each of these things. Okay. I'm going to go down here and we're going to line these up. Okay. So here's our four elements beryllium, neon, magnesium, and krypton. But the first thing I want you to do is go to your, go to your periodic table, pause the video, and then find out how many electrons each of these things has. This is D that we're on here, by the way. Okay, so pause the video and find out the number of electrons. Okay, so hopefully you have done that now. The number of electrons, I'm gonna quickly go through these. Beryllium has four, neon has 10, magnesium has 12, and krypton has 36. Okay, so now that we've done that, pause the video, do the electronic configuration for each one. All right, this is what we should have. One S2, two S2, that's the four electrons done. That's a two, by the way. Neon, we've got one S2, two S2, two P6. There's 10 electrons, that's it. Uh, magnesium, we've got one S2, 
2s2, 2p6, that's 10 electrons, 3s2, that's 12. And then the last one, Krypton, we've got 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, that's 12, 3p6, that's 18. Well, next sublevel is 4s2. Then we've got 3d, which can hold 10. How many is that? 2, 4, 10, 12, 18, 20, 30. And I need to get 36. So after 3d, 10, now we're in 4p, 6. Okay. All right. So that is uh, the three, uh, the four electronic configurations done. Let's go and check the next section. Look what it says here. It says to refer to these electron configurations. That means to use these. Use these electronic configurations to explain. Okay, why do the group 18 elements, neon and krypton, why are those chemically inert? Now, chemically inert means stable or unreactive. So these are, uh, these are elements that don't react. So use the configurations that we just wrote out to explain why these elements are unreactive. Okay, right, so let's go back down here now. Uh, as you can see here, I've lined this up. Why are neon and krypton inert? Okay, so what we gotta look at here is, well, the electronic configurations of these two things. What do they have in common? Okay, well, hopefully we can see that neon has eight electrons in its second main energy level. So it's got 2s2, 2p6. So it's got eight electrons. What we say here is that uh, this element here has, uh, has satisfies the octet rule. It satisfies the octet rule. And what this means is that the atom is very stable. Okay, so it's satisfying the octet rule, it's very stable. What about krypton? Krypton's the other, uh, the other noble gas. Well, let's look at its outer main energy level. Its outer main energy level is the fourth one here and here. And again, if we look at these two, these are the outer energy levels, we've got 3s2, 4p6. Again, that's a total in the fourth energy level of eight electrons. So it's the same story here. It satisfies the octet rule. Satisfies the octet rule, which again means that these elements are stable, extra stable. Okay, so now that I've shown that to you, what I want you to do is I want you to write a sentence that explains why neon and krypton are chemically inert. Do that now, please. Okay, so you should only be playing if you have answered this question. Okay, what do these thing, two things have in common? Okay, so what we should have said here is uh, these elements satisfy the octet rule by having eight electrons in their outer energy level. Okay, and then what does this mean? Why don't they react then? Pause the video and finish it off. Why don't they react? Okay, so hopefully we're said there that the reason, if they've got, if they have uh, satisfied the octet rule, this means that they are very stable. They are very stable. So keyword here, stable react that's why they're chemically inert but right, let's look at the very last little section here the last little bit uh, explain why the group two elements why are the group two elements beryllium and magnesium why is it that they are reactive okay so let's look at the other configuration the group twos beryllium and magnesium why are these ones reactive when the other ones were not? So beryllium, here's its outer energy level, and magnesium, here's its outer energy level. What's different about them compared to the two noble gases? So take a close look. 
I don't want to give you the answer this time. Okay, and now write in a sentence to explain why it is that these are reactive. Pause the video, do that now. Okay, so hopefully we've been talking about the fact that these do not have eight electrons in the outer shell. Okay, so they do not, these elements do not satisfy the octet rule. Why don't they satisfy the octet rule? That's the next sentence. They only have two electrons in their outer energy level. Why are they reactive then? What does this mean? So I'll finish it off. Or write another sentence to finish this off. Pause the video and do that now. It will be saying that they are not stable. And so they react. This is why they are reactive. Okay, is there any more? I'm going back up just to finish off reading the very last bit. I think there's another one. Why is magnesium... So look at this sneaky little question. It doesn't have a letter on it. Look, here was part one, part two, and then we've got this sneaky little bit at the end. Don't miss this. Why is magnesium more reactive than beryllium? Why is magnesium more reactive than beryllium? Okay, so magnesium and beryllium are in the same group. Okay, so we're thinking about groups now. What makes things reactive if they're in the same group? Here's beryllium. Beryllium is in group two and magnesium is also in group two. And it's asking us, well, why is magnesium more reactive than beryllium? Okay, so this is an extra little bit. Magnesium more reactive. They both have two electrons in their outer shell. Why is magnesium more reactive? Magnesium more reactive. Okay, so uh, what I need you guys to do is I need you to pause the video and write down the answer to that. Pause the video, do that now. Okay, so hopefully you're copying that magnesium beryllium in the same group, but magnesium is below it in the group. So what does that mean in terms of, you know, what patterns are there and how does that explain why it's more reactive? So if you didn't think about that, what patterns there are because it's lower in the group, think about that now and explain why it's more reactive. Okay, so hopefully we're talking about things like, okay, so magnesium has a bigger radius. Okay, if it's got a bigger radius, then this explains why it's easier to remove an electron from magnesium than beryllium. And that's what reacting is. Okay, it's also got a smaller first ionization energy. There's a number of ways you could say this. Okay, I'm just going to go with the simplest one that um, we would say uh, magnesium has a larger atomic radius than beryllium. Okay, uh, that's just one example. You, there's a couple of thing, other things that affect it. Um, magnesium has more shielding than beryllium. Uh, magnesium has a lower, uh, sorry, yeah, a, a smaller first ionization energy. Um, they, those are the main things. So, uh, outer electrons of magnesium are further from the nucleus, which is the same thing as what we said here. Uh, that magnesium has a, a larger atomic radius, but these are all the reasons that make it more reactive. So again, hopefully we, we uh, were able to put an answer together there. So I'm going to go through uh, the marking schemes here. Very quickly going to put them up. You can quickly go through them and correct them yourselves. So here is the plum pudding, very straightforward. Either have it or you don't. Uh, description, we were asked to draw it. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is what you must have. And the diagram, here is the, uh, this is what you should have at the end. Neptunium 237.93, is that what we had over here? Neptunium 237.93, so that's what we wanted there. Next thing then is I'm gonna put these up section by section. So I'm going to put A, B, and C up here. So these are the correct answers. So pause the video and go over them, correct them. Look at the acceptable answers. All right, and now I'm putting part D up. Well, okay, part D, I'm going to put part D 
up as far as part two. I'll put that up. So pause the video and check your answers. And finally, there's that last little bit. Again, pause the video, check your answers. All right, that was it, guys. Quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of work there, but that was um, there was quite a lot on atomic structure, as you can see in the 2020 exam question, uh, exam paper. Uh, so that's it, guys. We'll see you in the next one.